Phil Harris and Josh Vegan come together in an incredible fortnightly podcast, Dream Big, Move Fast. A progressive contemporary conversation on what it takes to be a dynamic thinker, leader and role model. Backed with over two decades of friendship, trials and tribulations, they teach from real world experience and what it takes to dream big, move fast. Dream more than others think practical, expect more than others think possible, care more than others think wise. Howard Shields. Phil, what are your thoughts on this one? Yeah, it's a, a great quote about, you know, thinking big, care, love of others. Um, so, yeah, good quote to particularly to kick off today's conversation. Yeah, I think this is a great one. You know, like um, Howard Schultz was obviously the founder and, and the CEO of, um, of Starbucks, and it's a great conversation around what they actually did in that American marketplace. And the big driver for me is, is that, you know, like it, it ultimately if you can dream it, you can do it. And we're going to have a great conversation today about the whole idea about no money down versus actually buying into an established business. And you know, it's kind of interesting, like, you know, um, both of us have been bootstrappers, you know, so we kind of started out from day one. And you think about that founding capital and what it is that you did and I think I had a laptop and $50 and that was kind of the way that I started the training business and that was a really awesome and exciting thing and, and Phil, I know that I had no idea what I was doing day one and, and thanks very much for being one of our first customers when I had no idea. I felt, I felt sorry for you. <laughs> no, that's okay. I thought there was two of us that had no idea so we felt good, good together but the, the interesting thing about it though is, is that you know what you actually learn you know, very, very quickly is, is that ultimately um, knowing what you know now, like, like geez, there's, there's a really big cost to actually doing startups yeah, versus being in a position that you you go and you buy into an established business. So we're going to have that, that great conversation today. Um, what, what do you think the cost of a startup is inside of the residential real estate marketplace today? Because I know that, you know, you can go down the road, you can probably um, lease a brand, you can get a you can be, get a brand identity and you can probably pay a, a monthly fee for that. Um, you can pay a franchise fee for that. Um, you can be in a position that you can make the decision to become an independent. Um, yeah, they're all very different levels at which you're going to go and play at. And, and you know what, neither of the, none, none of them are wrong, right? Because there are some people that really love a small ma and pa show and it gives them purpose and right in two or 300 grand a year is a great thing. And then there are other people that literally have completely different aspirations to be the number one in their marketplace and build significant asset value and all of the above. What are your thoughts about this whole idea of, of, of startups versus actually buying into an established practice? I think it's... Um, uh, I think there's two things. I think there's a there's a lot of perception versus reality. And then I also think it comes down to also just the nature of the beast, you yeah. know? So I, I think that um, startups, absolutely, for the people that uh, really, really want to do it for the right reasons, mm -hmm. you know? I think there's a lot of people starting real estate businesses more so for the perception than the reality, mm -hmm. almost like e egotistically. It's just, I just want to have principal or sales director on my my card as opposed to what's the actual responsibility or what's the actual purpose? What is the purpose of owning your own shop? You know, is it about having director on the card or is it about actually um, fundamentally growing people and leading people and having a passion for process and having a passion for growing something and building something and playing the long game and know that great businesses are built in decades, not in years. Like, is that really what drives you? And I've seen great examples out in Adelaide of some people are fundamentally, it is the right thing for them is to go and start a company and they should, and no one should ever stop them from doing that. So I think that's really great. But are you doing it for the right reasons? That would be one side of it in terms of doing the startup. But then there's also the other side of it where you see people who buy into an established business. There is major upside uh, in buying into an established business where all of that hard work has been done in terms of setting up system and process and brand recognition and brand awareness. And uh, a lot of people don't understand as well. It's not just kind of the physical, tangible challenges in setting up a business, but it's also the emotional toll that you take along the way that you can avoid a lot of that uh, by, you know, buying into an organization. Well, Phil, I don't mind a renovator's delight. And, and I know that sounds really funny, but I'm yeah. looking about, about the customer base and I'm looking at cash flow. And it's like, like um, you know, when you have a look at some of the most successful, I think that Shane Smolin is probably the most successful in Australia in terms of building building a real estate practice and on selling it. And and Shane- uh, Probably the most successful of all time. I don't know anyone who's ever done it better, right? And the interesting thing is that what Shane was absolutely a master at was actually buying 
an existing business and being able to extract value. So, so coming in there, wrapping a better quality brand around it, being in a position to think about better quality structures, being able to recruit two or three, four people to it relatively quickly, and then making sure that then you could continue to run that, you know, for, for, for decades, right? And I think that this is a really interesting conversation when you start to think, hey, you know what? I'd rather buy a cash flow every day of the week than I would to go and do a startup. So if you said to me, okay, great, you know, Josh, you got to come to Adelaide and you got to go head to head against Harris. Well, I wouldn't do it based on principle just because of our relationship over the years. But if, if you said, no, mate, I really need you to do it and I went and did it, like the number one thing that I would do is that I would try to buy an established business every day of the week. Why? I don't know many people in Adelaide. I don't really understand the marketplaces. I don't necessarily get what's actually going on in that market, but yet I've got a ton of residential real estate skills. But if I went in and I bought an established practice, what would I get? Exposure to a ton of customers. I'd, I'd get a great opportunity to be able to go and work a database and I would find data sets that no one actually sees as being valuable. Now, like as an example, you know, 10% of all property management businesses on average every year, uh, ultimately those landlords move on. And so you've got all these archive landlords. So if you think about it, like 100% of that over a 10 year period, all these archive landlords are sitting there and people are doing nothing with it. Well, where do those archive landlords actually live? Uh, what about all the past clients of the organization that have bought a property and done a transaction? You know, we saw a stat recently that 16% of all property transactions in Australia in the last 90 days, the vendor actually bought the property within the last three years. So yeah, you know what? There is a lot, like one in practically nearly every six listings is actually going to come from your past client database just in the last three years alone, let alone anything else that's going on. So if you're buying an established practice and then wrapping a brand around it, that's a completely different game as opposed to, you know, being a startup. And and this is that whole thing is about thinking that, you know, what are you doing? And I think Peter Knight over in the UK had said to me once, he goes, you know, Josh, people become business owners for a couple of different reasons. Sometimes they, they, it's, it's ego. Hey, hey, Phil, did you know I'm a director? I park yeah. in a director's car park. Sometimes it's about control. You know what, Phil? I think you do it all right, but I reckon I can do it better. Sure. I reckon I've got a better way of doing it, a, a, a nicer way to slice it, a better way to actually make sure we get profitability. And I'm not allowed in that management conversation. So I think I'm going to go somewhere where I'm allowed to be in that management conversation. Sometimes it's about equity. You know, I actually want a balance sheet item. I want to build something. And sometimes it's about legacy. You know what, man? I want to build something for my kids. I I really want to have given it a shot. You know, I want to try and get that perspective. And I think that that's an important conversation for you to get right, that when you're entering into this startup zone, is that, okay, great. There is a real value prop of actually um, buying into proven businesses. The challenges that we've actually got is that, you know, about really understanding that people say, hang on a second, Um, inside of a lot of business partnerships, what what we see is is that there's no valuation formula and then there's no conversation um, about, well, why do I have to pay for the value that I've already created? Now, ultimately, you know, Nick Dowling, um, you know, the the, the chairman now of of Jealous Craig was was famous for saying that. He goes, you know, you've got to be able to help people to to understand why they need to pay for the value creation on what they created on their way through. It's like, well, Phil, when we started, man, you know, you were just trying to do your first sale and now you're doing X number of sales. Like, I helped you to build that. Well, yeah, but you also got paid on your way through and you also did your role and I did my role and, and there's a lot of risk that was taken and all of those things. And this is actually about like learning how you say to people, hang on a second, what we're going to do is we're going to be selling shares as opposed to selling percentages. Because it's a bit like I walk up to you and I say, hey, Phil, man, if I can't have 50% of Harris real estate, man, I'm not in, bro. And you know, it's like, okay, great. Try that with BHP. It's <laughs> how yeah. much capital are you bringing, Josh? I yeah. got 10 grand. Okay, great. Well, man, you're going to need, I don't know, a billion dollars to buy into BHP to go and do that. There's some interesting principles just around that. What are some of your thoughts there in, in thinking that through? Um, I reckon it's a really fascinating conversation, Josh, because I actually think that we're fighting a tidal wave of culture in the industry, mm. that the industry culture swings towards, uh, you've been in real estate for 18 months and you wrote 250K last year, so you should open an office. Mm-hmm. Like that's what you're fighting against. Mm-hmm. So, well, that's the recruitment cycle, Yeah, so right? that's the recruitment So that, that's the nature and the, and the I, I guess, the, the structure of how our industry works, right? So mm-hmm. it's like open offices. That's the, the revenue model for the- Or work from home yeah, uh, right? in an opened office, yeah. <laughs> so you, you have that. That's that would be one side, and then the other side of it is really what you're leading into there, which is what we've also found is that the nature of the industry and the people that are in it, there's a lot of business naivety to actually not actually understanding the numbers and actually not understanding profitability of, of businesses as well. Mm. So when people come in, there's a, there's a lot of salespeople that um, they want to buy into a business. I think that salespeople think that real estate businesses are far more profitable than what they actually are. Mm-hmm. And then also don't have an understanding also of valuation metrics as well. Mm-hmm. And so you're trying to have a 
uh, what would you say, a, a highly adult uh, conversation, intellectual conversation about valuation metrics and multipliers uh, based on you know revenue and EBITDAs and these sort of things. And a sales business is very rushed and is not thinking maybe like a, a, a business owner as opposed to, you know, where they're at. So I think they're the things that make it quite complex in bringing some of these tools to, together. So just like listening to you there, is, is, it, is it a massive failure of leadership of the existing business owners to actually be able to get things in a structured way that it's actually a really easy decision for people to be able to buy in? Because uh-huh. when you start thinking about that, it's like, okay, great. So, so let's go and talk about the reasons why, like why you'd actually buy in, what it actually looks like, um, things to understand in terms of risk profiles, what, what, what the upsides are in terms of being a business owner, what some of the downsides are associated with that, and, and understanding, okay, great, you've got to have some capital aside because what I think we're really good at is building people that produce a ton of revenue, but they actually have no money. Yeah. And, and so like literally they've lived a great life and did you see my Range Rover and all of that other stuff? Yes. But, but hang on a second, you've got no cash, man. And so when it comes to buying in, there's this whole idea, well, it's easy to go and do a startup, but what they don't realize, man, you'll get a ha- haircut like me within a couple of weeks of starting your own because the interesting conversation is the stress and the anxiety and the challenges and the issues that you will come up against will be substantial rather than literally being inside of a thriving practice. Yeah, I, I think and it goes back to some of the previous episodes that we've spoken about, Josh. I think you're exactly right. There is a lot of responsibility that falls back on the existing principle where you know that question that you got to ask yourself, am I running a real estate office or am I running an actual business? Mm-hmm. And so if I'm running a business and I've got, you know, past few years, P&Ls all organized really tight and tidy, if I've got a balance sheet that's really tight and tidy, if I've got valuation metrics in place, if I've got all of these things, like, we, we need to be far more prepared to sit down and have those conversations with people to really explain it so that they can understand it so that we can move forward. So I think it, it is on both sides. I don't think principals are doing a great job at packaging up their business and providing the actual um, understanding for people to get their heads around it. And this is, a, you know, start with the end in mind. And I think that, you know, this is a class is that like, um, you know, watching my, my, my mum and dad, you know, having a business and yeah, sure, you know, um, in the very early days, mum's car was definitely paid for by the business. And, you know, and there's a few little accounting practices that were done because they were effective tax structures at the time. And this is kind of an interesting thing that might've been an effective tax structure, but it didn't necessarily make that a, a, a saleable business entity when people went to come and have a quick look at it. Which by the way, Josh, we had, we've been going through the same thing at Harris over the last kind of year or two where now where Harris got to a stage, we've got other people that want to buy in and be a part of it and be owners. But there are still structures for, that were in place for Phil and Jen Harris back when we had 10 staff as opposed to where we are now. And so there needs to be an actual uh, a growing up and a maturization. So this now has to be an actual business rather than just a vehicle for Harris family. We were in a position that we were helping a, a, a really good guy, young guy that was uh, looking to buy into an established business. And the, the business owner was really keen to do it. But the problem was, is that he was a third generation real estate agent and the original, original, um, you know, grandfather of the whole organization way back in the day had, had this one entity. And, and it turns out that that one entity at over a period of time, they've been very, very successful. That one entity not only owned the residential real estate businesses, the residential property management businesses, the actual physical buildings, but also they had a development company and had a couple hundred hectares of farms wow. underneath that one business. Wow. And so when this you know, young guy was like going, oh, look, I'm doing really well and I'd love to buy in. He's like, man, I'd love to sell in. Man, the capital gains tax issues, the exiting issues, the relationship issues, the other brother that was going through a divorce that also owned a portion of the business, like all of those things that had been wrapped up. And it got so complicated. And you know what? Um, there was this new blue sky thinking moment where I said, guys, why don't we just open up another entity that's a clean skin? And from this point forward, like all the new property managements are actually going to go into that. And they had a couple of geographical sites, so it's very possible that that could actually happen, right? And and then that way we just overcome all of those issues that we've got around accounting and we can start to build value into that organization over a period of time. But we've actually got a really good quality business operator that can sit inside of that business. And I think that this is a really interesting thing about, I say, okay, great, you know, start with the intention. I think that there's a packaging issue that we've got with existing businesses. Are you actually in a position? And what's the benefit of getting someone in, by the way, and, and having a co-owner. It's like you've got someone else that's got pulling power. You've got energy that comes with that. You've got income production that they go to right. 
you've got a role model sitting inside of the business, you're starting to de-risk the business model of just a key person. You know, you're no longer lonely in business. There's a good book on that. And you start being in a position that you can high five other people and you can do all of those things. You don't have to succeed 100% control. And I think on the other side is that as a minority shareholder, what you've got to realize is that you get a seat at the table. You get a, a mastermind group of people that are around you. You get protected. You've actually got other people that can do a lot of the heavy lifting so that you don't have to do all of that heavy lifting from day one. And you can still live a really good quality life. I think for existing business owners as well, Josh, is just getting clear on what the model is that you actually want for your business. Um, uh, in my experience in the industry, Josh, it's just so easy to move around. And so if you're wanting to actually scale, if you're not prepared to bring in um, equity partners, then I think you're going to find it very, very hard to build and scale an organization because as we spoke about before, the nature of the industry, it is just so easy for somebody to be offered 100% equity of their own shop and they you know they are you know sold the dream and now do you know what I love that you get 100% of the revenue but they never mention the 100% of the expenses either <laughs> correct but that but that's what you're fighting against and so if you want to actually build a sustainable business for the long term and you want to have high quality people inside your organization then you do need to be have a, be able to have the right vehicle where people can come and actually take a piece of that you know this is kind of interesting there's um you know Les McCone wrote a book called predictable success and He's like, I'll go through the stages, right? So if you start to think about that, it's like um, early startup, right? So you see this starting up, it's like, yeah, okay, great. Trying to, trying to work out what's going on. And that's kind of really cool, right? And then and then, then you go into the next stage, which is kind of like struggle. And you're trying to like struggle, like how do we actually make all this stuff happen? And then there's the, the day that's like, um, fun. Do you remember when it was fun? Like, man, we just got a listing. We got a board up. And we yeah, drive yeah. past that sole board a couple of times. Like, totally. that, honey, totally. that's mine. You know? And totally. then, then after fun, then all of a sudden you get into white water. And all of a sudden you're being just you know, smashed and thrashed all over the place. And it's not because of the financial white water, but just there's a lot of things coming at you and all of a sudden you go, oh, there's legal and compliance and all these issues and challenges and, you know, tax and all of this other stuff that happens. And after white water, you get to predictable success. So you now know you do this and you get that and you do this and you get that and you do this and you get that. And after predictable success, you then can get into treadmill. So you're just going through the treadmill stages of what's actually happening in business. And after treadmill, you kind of get yourself into a position of big rut. And after big rut, then there's our favorite stage in business, which is death rattle. And, and when you think about that is that I walk into a business and I say, okay, great, where is this business at today? So is this an early starter struggler or is this someone who's in fun? Is this someone who's in white water? Is this someone who's actually hit predictable success? Are they in treadmill right now? Are they in a position that they've hit big rut or are they in death rattle? And and what I've got to do as the coach is I've got to say, okay, great, where are they at right now and how do I guide them back to predictable success and, and or, or actually help them with a successful exit? And I think that this is a really important conversation is, is that you know, your job is to actually say, okay, great, when you're actually thinking about people coming into a business, they've got to actually understand, okay, great, where's the upside here? as opposed to this is what you're buying and this is the valuation methodology that comes along with that. And actually understanding it's okay to have one, two or 3% inside of a business if it's a really good business. You look at Warren Buffett and his ownership of Coca-Cola. You know, it's like you don't have to own the whole show to be highly successful with it. What is important is a seasoned management team, a good leadership team and some great conversations around that to make sure it all happens. So we're going to finish with our final principle today. You know, what would a new CEO do in the first 30 days? There's always a decision you should have made. What are your thoughts about that as a principle to get you you off the fence of indecision to start making decisions to get progress in your business. Yeah, I like it. it reminds me of a, a case study of a uh, uh, a company in the US called Best Buy. Uh, Josh, not sure if you're aware of uh, the company over there, but there was a, a great case study on a, on one of the lecturers at, at Harvard there, and he, they talk about the, this uh, company that was really going into a spiral of going down. And a CEO comes in, the guy who actually uh, now lectures at, at Harvard on this specific case study, and for that first thirty days. Uh, Best Buy, which is basically an electronic store. Yeah, uh, in like the, JB Hi-Fi. Yeah, like JB Hi-Fi in the US, man, com- complete turnaround. I think it was the first 30 or 60 days, he went straight to the sales floor and he worked as the CEO of something like, you know, a thousand outlets across the US, literally just worked on the sales floor. I think it was actually for the first 90 days, mm. next to the sales team, monitoring every single customer that came in and out of the shop to find out why are we losing why is it, you know, what, what, what are the problems with our staff? How come we're not converting? What's the layout of the shops? And really got a feel for it. So when I'm reading, what would a new CEO do inside a real estate organization? Get at absolute grassroots level and find out what the blockages are. What are the challenges inside the organization? And then come back with a really clear plan on how we're going to resolve that and bring people on the journey. So 
that was a great little one to wrap it up there. You know, the interesting conversation is also about Howard Schultz, right? Like, I think he's come back third time as the CEO for Starbucks, and he's now got a CEO that's that's absolutely going to, you know, take that brand, you know, forward, and it's awesome. The interesting conversation, that new CEO actually spends one day on the floor as a barista in a different Starbucks every week in the course of his first two years of being inside the organization. Wow. So like literally learning, you know, what it takes, what it's the cultural diversity and what are the issues and the challenges in running a store and, and what he's actually doing is he's immersing himself inside of the systems and the methodologies and what's broken, what doesn't work because it's such a mammoth organization but get back to the grassroots of what it I, is that we actually I, do. I, right? I, I really like that. Um, I think it can happen in real estate office as well, particularly for, for sales principles. If you get to a point where you're no longer listing or selling, you need to stay totally attached to the problems of what a salesperson or a property manager deals with on a day-to-day basis, as granular as whatever that might be. It might be about an ingoing, a routine, or a letterbox drop. Are you really connected to the issues? Because that's what affects revenue. Feeling good and ready for more? Thanks for joining us on Dream Big, Move Fast. Move Fast.